Welcome to B2B Commerce Corner. Commerce Corner is a sub-series of the E-Commerce Edge podcast discussing all things B2B commerce through the lens of agencies, consultants, merchants, and more. Enjoy. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the podcast. I've got another amazing episode lined up for you today. We've got Andrew Carlson from Distributor Data Solutions. Andrew, welcome to the pod. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Mate, it was so fun. We were walking down memory lane a little bit here, and we were talking about how we've got so many connections in common. You said you looked down through the roster of some of my previous guests, and you said, I know them, and I know them. So how bad could it possibly be to come and have this conversation with yeah. Jason? Exactly. No, it was. it's nice to see. Thank you for the invitation, first of all. But yeah, it's nice to see that you've talked to people I've known, people I've worked with, products I've used. Yeah, very excited to be here. Oh, it's so good to have you along for the ride today. And we were also talking about the fact that our industry, it's a bit like that. Like it's, it's like only six degrees of separation between yeah. almost anybody in the industry. And you oftentimes run across people in the industry multiple times throughout your career. And sometimes they've changed roles. Sometimes you've changed roles. Sometimes they've changed companies and where you work and locations and everything else. But the one thread that seems common is you will run across these people again. So definitely don't burn any bridges unnecessarily because no, no. it'll come back to bite you in the behind if you do. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Actually, that's not that's how I actually ended up at, at Distributed Data Solutions. The customer, twice. Wow. Once, once as a working at a leading digital transformation for a manufacturer, and once as a marketing leader, e-commerce leader for a distributor, and was a customer twice. And then the founder called me up and asked if I would be willing to come lead marketing for them, and said absolutely. So I love the product. I love what they. The, the value they provided me twice, and I'm happy to share it with other people. So, yeah, case in point, myself. Yes. you. What do they say? They say you got to eat your own dog food, right? right. And yeah. you've done it twice now. And this is a very cool thing. I, I found out about you through B2B Online, and that's how I found out about you and what you guys do and heard about your company and thought, geez, this is – E-commerce full stop is a pretty tight-knit community. And then you, when you yeah. narrow it down into the subset of B2B e-commerce, and it's even a smaller, even more tight-knit community. Because yeah. I tell you, when you're working with manufacturers, wholesalers, and distributors, it's a totally different world than it is when you're working in B2C and D2C. And yeah. their needs are different. Their challenges are different. Their clients and what their customers expect are different. The products that they're working with are vastly different. The amount of data that you need around products to explain highly complex products, both from a unstructured and structured data perspective, imagery, exploded drawings, diagrams, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This whole B2B world is just a unique beast, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. No, couldn't have said it better myself. Couldn't have said it better <laughs> myself. Yeah. But it's a heck of a lot of fun and it's never it boring is. and you never run across two B2B businesses that are alike. And that's the thing I love. And right. I love consulting to these businesses because in the B2C and D2C world, there's a lot of design patterns that have become very common. There's a stack when you're a startup and then there's a stack when you're medium size and then there's a stack when you're a small enterprise and there's a stack when you go to big enterprise and you start out with the Shopify Clavio stack and then you progress and maybe you're running zero and QuickBooks in the back end and then when you get a little bit bigger, maybe you migrate to NetSuite in the back end and then you maybe stay on Shopify on the front end but then maybe you have a PIM and maybe you've got some of these other components of the stack and so there's this kind of almost prescribed pathway if you work in the b2b sorry b2c and d2c world but in the b2b world these businesses are so very different and the types of products that they're working with are so very different and the way that they go to market are so very different and the complexities of shipping and fulfillment and will call and all the rest it it really does mean that every engagement is so unique that you never ever get bored working in the b2b world do you yeah no exactly Exactly. The products may not be as sexy, but yeah. the problems are even more interesting to solve, I think. And this is exactly where you guys come in. Yeah. One of the, I've read some studies, some recent studies, both from DC360, Hokoto, and a few others working sure. in our space. And one of the things that keeps emerging time and time again is product data and yeah. the challenges around product data. Capturing it, organizing it, structuring it, syndicating it, surfacing it through a website in a meaningful way. It's just a nightmare for most B2B brands to even think about product data, especially when you think about the fact 
that the average catalog size in the B2B world is orders of magnitude bigger than yeah. the typical catalog in the B2C and D2C world. In the D2C yeah. world, if you got 2,000 products on your website, you've got a bloody big website. Yep. In the B2B world, you would never, almost never have just 2,000 products. You might have 20,000, or you might have 200,000, or you might have 2 million, yep. but it's very rare that you would only have 2,000. And so yeah. this whole B2B world, it, the complexities around product data management and syndication they grow exponentially as your catalog explodes, and as the categories you work across explode, this becomes a monster challenge. And this is clearly something you guys have identified and said, we can help. Yeah, that's how the company was started, actually, was the two founders came out of the electrical distribution space and say, you know what, there's got to be a better way to solve this problem because we are spending so much time and energy and resource trying to get the right information in front of our customers and trying to coordinate this process with all of our different manufacturer partners and get it in a standard format and through a single source. And so that's ultimately what DDS has solved, right? We, as a manufacturer, we can get your data to all of your distribution partners through a single source in the format they need, right? And syndicate it as often as you are willing to give us that updates and new products and helps people get new products into market faster. Um, and then on the distributor side, just the other side of it, right? You need your data in a single source in your format with your unique requirements. Um, and so we aggregate all that manufactured data and we'll go and recruit new manufacturers on your behalf if they're not part of our network already today. We have 1,700 brands and 400 distributors. So we have a lot of them already, but we will continue to, to onboard and, and introduce new manufacturers and new distributors on behalf of our distribution partners or our manufacturer partners. And when I was a manufacturer, I learned about DDS back in 2017. And I this was a problem I had. I had 700 data requests coming into my team a year right, from 150 different distribution partners. Some was every month, some were once a quarter, some were once a year, but 700 requests and those on average took between a day to two to fulfill. So you can do the math and figure out how many hours and people that requires to do that. And we're able to work with DDS, send them our data on a weekly basis once. And um, I think even just the company's bandwidth, they're still using it today. And we're able to syndicate data to 80% of the distributors for Panduit through a single source, they send us one file a week. So we had 10 people doing that work before, and eight of those people were able to go do other things. And I don't mean do other things like leave the company or do that kind of stuff, like work on the quality of the content, work on the quality, the merchandising of the product, expand, continue to refine and optimize the attributes, all that work that you want to find the time to do, but you end up just getting your, trying to get your fill out spreadsheets and send your data in the market. And so once we could stop doing that and have DDS do it for us, we were able to make our data even better. There's a story I like to tell if I got time for a story. I think I oh, do. Of course. It's a, I call it the 800 pound, 800,000 pound hug. And those pounds aren't uh, actual weighted pounds. Those are British pounds, money. And as a Christmas party or a holiday party in England, and one of the salespeople saw me from across the room and said, hey, you're the guy responsible for the data, right? And usually when somebody points at you like that, you're like, oh. You're going, oh, God, what, what, what did he mess do? up? Yeah, what did he right? screw up? He said, come here. I'm giving you a hug. You earned me my Christmas bonus. I'm like, oh, okay, great. Yeah, this is great. What did I do? He said, because we were able to get our product data into the hands of our distributor for the new products that they needed in their systems to win that quote or to fulfill the quote, we won the quote. So he got an 800,000 800, pound order and the primary reason given was how fast we could get them the data. So I got lifted off the ground, spun around, and I said, you're buying the beer. So he gladly did because he had his bonus. So yeah, it was a nice story. But anyway, so that's the 800,000 pound hug. Wow, I love that story. <laughs> that's so indicative of, I, I think, the challenges that most of these manufacturers, wholesalers, and distributors face to the point where oftentimes when I'm going and I'm consulting to these brands, they think, oh, cool, we'll put, in a, we'll put in a PIM system, and it'll solve all our problems. We need a PIM. We need a place to organize. We've only got an ERP today, and it's terrible for managing and organizing and syndicating data. Oh, cool, we'll get in Syndigo, or we'll get in, we'll get in Salsify, we'll get in whatever, Kenya, whatever, and our problems will all go away. Oh, because we, can, because we can expose a login to our PIM system for all of our suppliers, and they can enrich their own data. They can upload the CSVs of their products and the images and all that sort of stuff, so our problem's going to go away if we implement a PIM system. Yep. What happens when they implement a PIM system? 
doesn't fix their problems. Yeah. And so oftentimes, what happens is then you need to go and you need to pick up the pieces after the fact because all the ROI they thought they were going to get out of their PIM system, they're not getting out of the PIM system because it doesn't solve their problems. The yeah. problems, the problem oftentimes starts way, way before trying to organize the data, and it is first of all getting it from somewhere, getting it from a supplier of some variety of this data, standardizing it, making it consistent, and then being able to syndicate it out from there. And oftentimes, it starts their problems start way before a PIM system. Yep. They start way before the ERP. They start way before anything else. They start way before the website, and they yeah. start way before their distributors' websites. Yep. And so the reality is these brands really struggle, and, and especially if they are running a multiple business model, business models within their business, if they are if they're doing some first party manufactured products, if they're doing selling some third party products that they are a distributor for, because very rarely, in my experience as a manufacturer, only sell stuff they manufacture. They will oftentimes be a distributor for other components that they don't manufacture. Sure. So they can present a complete solution around a problem to the market, even for the products they don't manufacture. Then we have the third thing in the mix here, which is a lot of these B2B brands also want to be a marketplace for the products that they don't ever want to have in their ERP, that they never want to ha have in their warehouse, and they right. never even want to necessarily have a dropship relationship for, but they do want to clip the ticket for every transaction, and they want right. to be able to monetize all the beautiful traffic that they're driving to their e-commerce website. Yep. Now, all of a sudden, they got a real data problem on their hands, because yep. maybe their first-party product data they've got, because they're the manufacturer, maybe they got that data in-house, maybe they got the images and the videos and all that sort of stuff in-house, but for the stuff they distribute and for the stuff that's coming through for marketplace sales, they have a real problem on their hands. Yeah. And this feels like a situation that you guys uniquely solve for. Yeah. No, the, the last point you bring up there around the marketplace, either the marketplace concept or even just wanting to display the entire portfolio for the manufacturers you have relationships with, right? But you're a distributor and you only want to stock your A, B and some of your C items, but you want to be able to show your D's and your special orders and all that other stuff. We ran a project that my last last distributor I worked for, I called it Add a Zero, right? And adding a zero was adding a zero to the number of products that we had on our website. So I could start to earn the long tail traffic, show the breadth of offer, give my give my Google uh, Merchant Center more data to work with, give my Performance Max or Google Ads or Shopping or whatever we want to call them now, uh, ca ad campaigns, more fuel to, to choose to optimize against to do a better job of presenting the right solution and give me more chances to bring people into my site. And you always have to come up with a clever name for a project because what's a project without a clever name, right? It just doesn't, it's easy, harder to talk about. So you have to have a clever name for everything you do. But, but yeah, that was the, and CFOs love that because it's cash without inventory risk. It's, it's an ability to, we also did that with our ENO inventory. I've told this story a few times, but it, it resonates in that we had a excess. We had too much of the wrong stuff. No distributor ever has that problem. And so yeah, we took a look the at two million SKU catalog. Never have this problem. <laughs> right. So we took a look at all the items that weren't. So we took a look at all the items that were in that excess and obsolete inventory report, and we found that two thirds of them weren't online, nor were they merchandised on a shelf in a storefront. How are you going to find it? Or how's so, the customer even going to know you got yeah, it? Exactly. So we prioritize building out the, the data and work with DDS to quickly onboard a lot of those products. And we were able to generate uh, $400,000 in sales and over the course of five to six months and relieve a million dollars in E&O inventory just by adding products that we already had in our possession to the website. Seems simple when you say it out loud, right? But <laughs> it's just the process of, it was the process of going through and digging through the individual details, right? But then having the partner in DDS to be able to do this at scale and do it quickly. And it was a nice big win in our income statement in a short period of time. I have a finance background too, so I'm always thinking about the income statement, the balance sheet, the cash flow. Um, and so in addition to merchandising product and syndicating data. On the flooring costs, as you say, if this is taken up physical warehouse yeah. space, the cost yeah. for this goes through the roof real fast and it eats up any potential profit you might have made. If it sits there for 12 months and there's no product churn, there's no momentum and throughput on the sales of that product. And in the B2B world, margins are slim. So yeah. the reality is you can very quickly burn through the marginal profit you might have made on that product just in flooring costs alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And absolutely. so for you guys, how would you guys think about yourself when we think of there's platforms out there like One World Sync, there's platforms out there like DataX, there's PIM platforms and syndication platforms like Syndigo. There are, there are other 
providers, vendors, whatever you want to call them out there that seem sure. and purport to solve some elements of what you do, but maybe they don't do it like you do, and maybe they don't fulfill it exactly, they don't plug all the gaps that you plug. So how do you think you guys uniquely solve for this data challenge that these brands have that, that is quite different to other solutions that might be in the market? Good question. Uh, probably, uh, there's a few ways I, I would answer that. Um, one, we work directly with 1700 industrial manufacturer brands, right? We grew up in the industrial space. And so we're working with people in electrical, people in HVAC, people in plumbing, and we're working directly with their data teams and bringing in as much data as they will provide. We have no limits on what we will ingest and we will work with you on getting it into our environment. We don't say, here's the template and good luck. Don't Who say, has time for that, right? Yeah. And we'll say, oh, we, or, or we don't say, oh, we'll only take seven specifications because that's all we can handle, right? That's what you get with a lot of the data pools and some of the other broad scale syndication providers. So we know that the specifications and the long tail of specifications are so important to our end users. Um, because in the electrical space, for example, at best, if data is bad or missing, it's a return. At worst, if data is bad or missing, it's it causes a, a fire. It causes a fire. It causes harm. It causes. So we understand the importance of being able to provide everything and anything that a manufacturer is able to able to provide us. We also that includes unlimited images, unlimited video, spec sheets, all of that stuff. We also opt. We also self optim or not self optimize. We also optimize every image. So if your images aren't optimized for the web, we take care of that in our platform. And so when you send them to the distributors, they're in the format they need. So right. that's an, that's another advantage as well. And then. We work directly with each distributor to get it in their format. So oftentimes syndication means with other providers, syndication often means we can push it to a place and then you take it and then you do all the work and map it into your own system. Right? And it might be their PIM system on their end, for example. Yeah. And so we have 400 integrations with different distributors where we're delivering your data in their format. And a lot of other providers don't go that last mile. So we actually work with, the, we don't view the PIM providers as competitors. We view the PIM providers as partners because we help them solve what PIMs are good at when you're working with some of the big marketplaces, the Amazons, the merchant centers, the, if I need the, the common integrations, but if I need to get it into a specific distributor's format, that's not what the PIM providers are good at. They don't do that at scale. And so that's where we end up partnering a lot of times or being brought in addition to someone who is just invested in a PIM, whether it's on a manufacturer or a distributor side. And you raised a very good point, which is that Amazon business is trying to be, they're trying to be the marketplace of choice for business yep. business transactions of physical goods, not just the B2C and D2C world. And they're growing fast. Mm -hmm. And they know they've got weaknesses in terms of logistics around B2B products. And they've got gaps in categories that they can't service yet. Yep. But they presumably have similar problems to all the other manufacturers and distributors in the industry. So do you work with platforms and marketplaces like the Amazons of the world to help them with their data enrichment sure. process to make sure that the products that are listed on their website actually have standardized data sets associated with them in their schema so that the things as simple as faceted search actually work on the Amazon yeah. website based on product attributes? Yeah, we can. It's not our core. Let's say Amazon in particular, it's not our core, but we can. We've manufacturers wanted to help us, have us help them with that process and we absolutely can and have done that. Um, we've worked with more, I don't wanna say traditional is probably the wrong word, but you think of the Grangers and the Fastenals and the West Coast. McMaster Car, et cetera. Car, right? The people that have, not only do they have the, the core capabilities that are required of a distributor, but they also have the expertise in the product line where the expertise doesn't just come from the content on the page. It leads with the content on the page Right, and that's where we come in. But then they have the support organization and the fulfillment organization and the physical locations that the contractors can go in and pick up the product if need or they can ask questions if needed. And so that's where we've we focus. But we, we also work with some of the large marketplaces as well. Wow. And when you go in and you first start working with a manufacturer or a distributor, what are the typical biggest top three challenges that you find when you start digging around under the bonnet, what are the biggest three data challenges that they typically face when they're trying to, because oftentimes these catalogs are of such a scale. Where I remember I was working with a manufacturing brand, and again, they manufacture about 20 to 30% of their catalog, and then they're a distributor for the rest of their mm -hmm. catalog, but they're going to market with a whole solution set. 
around, in this particular case, it was hygienic pumping and plumbing equipment. And they, or of the, I think, the 200 or 300 other manufacturers that they work with and distributors that they work with, they, they had a queue that was a year long of onboarding some of these brands into their business and getting their products listed. Or if they had their products listed, oftentimes it was just a skew and a name with no other additional attributes around that product. And so therefore those products, as you rightly point out, it's hard to move those products when maybe it's a skew and a name and maybe a manufacturing brand associated yeah. with it. And that's it. No images, no attributes, nothing else, no facets, no nothing. And so they were about a year behind getting, if, if they could have increased the velocity Yep. of getting products enriched in their catalog and getting them ready to sell through their e-commerce platform, they would have jumped for joy. They were hundreds of thousands of products behind, basically. Yeah. And so when they went to take on a new brand, they were very clear with the brand, hey, look, it's going to take us between 8 and 12 months before we can get your catalog fully attributed and listed and displayed on our website because we've got this backlog that we're dealing with. It's a major challenge. Yeah, that's exactly the one of the conversations I usually like to have with manufacturers in particular is how long does it take you to launch a product into your distribution network? And then also, do you actually know when it's live? Do you know when they upload it or do you know that you sent it and that's it? And then you have product managers, channel managers, sales leaders knocking on your door saying, Hey, I was just on uh, xyz.com and our new products aren't on their website yet. What the heck? Those are supposed well, I to launch. I thought we had a partnership with them. Yeah. Those are supposed to be in the market three months ago. We had a plan, right? We were supposed to deliver X million dollars of growth this year on their product, and it's not even on their website. Oh, we sent it in March, and they told us it would be live in six months. And right, that's, the pro that's one of the problems we solve. And so when we have these relationships with the distributors, we often get to jump the line. We're the fast pass, right? Because we're sending... We, not only do we send e-commerce data, but we also create ERP files for our, our customers as well. And so you can get the data loaded quickly into your ERP, which then usually pushes to your PIM if you have a PIM. Your and then ERP further enrichment be, in happens in the PIM. Yeah, and further enrichment happens in the PIM, and then we give you the PIM file. Or if you're loading it straight to your CMS, whatever format you need. And now that manufacturer's products are getting on that site in weeks or days or even hours, depending on the syndication cadence versus months or heaven forbid, like you said, 12 months or a year. So that's one of the main challenges we solve. And I always lead with new products because every business's plan has a new product portion of their plan. And we're all optimistic in October and then January 1st hits and we think it's going to be magical because it's the new year and process doesn't care. Backlogs don't care. So then it comes to Q end of Q1 and you're behind on your new product goals. And then so you now, now you have some urgency and that's when the questions start coming. And so we can help people with that. But the other piece that people often forget about is we're also refreshing all of the entire portfolio. So either you're not sending us any updates and therefore we're confirming that it's still good, valid, up-to-date information, or we're taking incremental changes and then syndicating those on your behalf as well. And so now not only are new products in market faster, changes are in market faster, updates, enhancements, um, replacement parts are in market faster as well. And so that's one of the big challenges that once people get it, they're like, oh, wow, that could be worth a lot of money. And then the other thing is, like you talked about, there's this big manual backlog, um, and people can only process so many spreadsheets at a time. And that's the back and forth of, oh, you know what, you're missing this data and my it's a required field and so I can't process this entire category because you're missing these two and my standards attributes. require me to have these two attributes before it can get loaded. Or yes. the, yeah. So that's another thing we help solve is we also provide data health analytics to our manufacturers and say, hey, here's all the holes in your data, right? We're looking at your data in mass. We provide you a report every time you syndicate or you send us new data. Um, multiple, If you have uh, duplicate data, your UPCs, or you're missing Prop 65 data or whatever it is, we give you feedback and here's all the things you're missing and this distributor is going to require that. So this is where you're probably going to have some issues. So you go back and Instead of, remember the game on the prices, right? Where you had five prices and five products and you hang yes. them and you come back and you pull the lever and it says three. Yes. yes. Well, which three? And it didn't tell you, right? Yes. Well, we'll tell you it's three out of five, but then we'll tell you which three are right, which two are wrong. We won't make a guess and keep running around and pull the lever again. That's basically what our data health analytics do. So that's another problem we end up solving. But yeah, I could go on, but let's stop that one there and then we'll keep talking. 
And how do you help these manufacturers or distributors, and depending on which pl gap you're filling, what we find in this, that example that I gave you, one of the challenges to them onboarding these products into the business wa wasn't just, you know, finagling and mas massaging the spreadsheets. It was literally, in many cases, there was no data provided by the manufacturer or it was a very limited subset of data. So, for example, they would literally have to sometimes go out to the warehouse, grab the box of the product. They'd have to look at the box of the product. They'd have to manually type in the attributes that are on the box of the product or they'd have to literally go to the manufacturer's website. They'd have to download the PDF or they'd have to they'd have to browse their website, go to the page with this product information on it, copy, paste it into yeah. their PIM system or into their CMS, and they would have to do this work manually. They would literally have to scrape the website manually. They'd have to download a PDF and copy and paste text out of a PDF, take a screenshot of a PDF of images and pull the images out and load those up. As it sounds Byzantine and it sounds insane, <laughs> but this still happens yeah. more often than we would like to admit, that manufacturers do not make their product data, even if they have it, they don't provide it in a format that is even remotely usable by the brands that are going to be selling their yeah. products. Hey team, I have a big favor to ask you. Please pause this episode and send the link of this episode to someone you know that you think would enjoy this content. Really appreciate you spreading the word. This is how we grow. We're not a Joe Rogan. We don't have big, massive advertising budgets, but we absolutely want to grow. We want to get the learnings from all of these episodes out to as wide of an audience as possible, and we need your help to do it. Thank you. And now back to your listening. Yeah. Well, that's one of the benefits is that we, when they, when it's provided to us, we turn it, we provide it to you in a format that can be, is usable. Right. Um, and then another part of our process for distributors is you send us a list of all the products you're looking for and all the manufacturers. And we do a one-to-one -one match and give that data back to the manufacturer. And then we also manage the process for the manufacturer and say, hey, by the way, we'll just use Granger. Granger is requesting your data. Are they authorized to, to sell this? Data. To have your data, right? And so you can manage authorizations as well. And so you can understand who has your data, but you can also say who shouldn't get your data, right? We don't just open it up and make it available to everybody. We give it to the people that ask for it and have the, and also have the ability to, that have the right to use it and the right to have it and the right to sell your product. Now, we let you manage those authorizations. We don't do that ourselves. I don't want to be making decisions for you as a manufacturer, right? But our Acadia platform, which is our new uh, product access cloud that we just introduced uh, three months ago, allows you to manage authorizations. Another part of that is you talked about incomplete data. And what we see is a lot of manufacturers have really bad product descriptions or really bad product names even because it was built 15 years ago when in the ERP when the character limits were 80 characters long and the product description could be 160 characters long, right? You maybe have two, two features and benefits associated with it. So now manufacturers can upload whatever they have and if they don't have a PIM, they can use our Acadia Access Cloud and edit their product data real time in Acadia before they syndicate it out um, and we're getting really close it's probably good enough but I don't it's not we want it to be really good no uh, we're getting close to introducing product description and product naming convention enhancements through AI through our Acadia AI models um, so that's coming as well and so this Acadia platform that we've introduced it's how we now deliver our services both for distributors and manufacturers and it's included with every subscription we provide and does that mean that you also and here, can you? Oh yes, and, I love and, it. Can you ingest? So let's say the manufacturer provides you a I don't know a thousand PDFs. Do you guys like scan the PDF and pull the data out, or do they need to be able to provide it to you in a structured data format that you can actually do something with? And you'll go back to them and say, "That's great, you provide us a bunch of PDFs, but we need this data in a structured data format that we can take in and plumb into our database." Yeah, I'm the. I'm not aware of us doing any of the kind of the scraping of the PDF and turning it into structured data. I'd have to ask the data team. I don't think we'll take all the PDFs and we'll share all the PDFs because we want the data that we send to be yours. Ah, right? yes. the, and we're, I think we're, uh, I'm a bit reluctant to go and scrape and interpret and then relate structure. And structure. Mm -hmm. but, but it becomes an asset that's downloadable by that the that distributor, for example. Um, that's a good question. I don't. I've only been here since January, so I don't know everything. But I do know we we will host all those spec sheets and other documents, and you can either we'll either upload them and host them for you, or you can give us a URL to where they reside, and we can share that with the whole distribution network. But I'd have to find out more if we're actually. I know we could 
communicate. I know physically, not physically, we could do it from through code. We could do it. Yes. I just don't know if it's a service that we offer. And yeah. I, I mean, could make it, it up, but then it, that wouldn't be good. So, no. <laughs> yeah. And in the B2B world, things like MSDSs and things like that, they become like really critical, as you say. Yeah. Maybe they have a safety component. Maybe they've got a compliance component. Maybe there's actually, there's a lot to this product data thing that goes beyond just making it, e making it easier to sell and easier yeah. to merchandise and easier for search merchandising and personalization platforms to get their teeth into this data and then present it in the right way, make product recommendations, cross-sells, upsells, substitutions, product successions. Yeah. All that stuff is really important and you can't do that without good product data. But in many cases, it extends beyond pure a pure merchandising strategic play no, you bring up a great and it's point. compliance is that some of these safety data sheets they're referenced in validation processes right and a change to that document would require a change in a validation process by an end user or by a distributor or by a manufacturer and so that's why if i'm thinking out loud again i don't know the answer but one of the reasons i'm reluctant to say that yeah we could do that because i understand the importance i came from i spent a few years in life sciences the implications of changing documentation that's used in a research process that then that research process led to the ultimately the production process of something that's ingested by people or a pharmaceutical or by the the repercussions of that seem small but they could be rather significant Massive. and so i'm always it, a little could, bit it comes to down to the reagent that. it comes down yep. to the gene it got, there's a lot to this yep exactly Exactly. Wow. Exciting. Exciting. And how do you guys charge for your services? Is that on a per SKU basis? Yeah. Is it, is that, what's your model? What's your business yeah. model? Your SaaS platform, meaning yep. that they don't have to host that infrastructure. That's your Acadia platform, et cetera. That's all hosted yep. by you. So it's SaaS in that respect, presumably all connected together via APIs to this, from the source system and to the destinations, all API capable. Presumably, yeah. it, CSV it can be, but it doesn't well. have to be, right? You can just send us your files to a CSV, uh, secure FTP, put them on a yeah, SFTP and server, and we'll yeah, pick them up. Exactly, exactly. So we don't even we're flexible there as well. But you no, know, it's a subscription-based model. All of our models include, or all of our subscription tiers include unlimited SKUs. Wow. Um, because we understand the the product data and the completeness of the portfolio is what's most valuable, or one of the things that's most valuable to our distri distribution partners and to our manufacturers. Data is the new oil, right? And we yeah. keep hearing it, yeah. but data in its own right, without it being organized, is useless, right? Yeah. It's got to be organized. It's yep. got to be structured. Yep. So they all include unlimited SKUs. Um, and then the tier, what's available to you within each subscription tier, things like how much effort, how many different data formats you're sending to us. Some, one of our customers has 17 different PIMs that they're providing to us. Wow. Um, right through acquisition they've had and they haven't integrated and that's fine and they're a global company and so they're sending us 17 different feeds from 17 different either it's a PIM or an ERP or data sources well, maybe and so PLM that's a lot more for complex that matter, especially if they're a manufacturer it's probably yeah. coming from PLM for that matter yeah exactly so it's so that's much more complex and so that level of complexity is where our subscription tiers and our enterprise tier will vary but but yeah if you have if you're looking to just get your manufacturer and you want to get your data to over 150 uh, distributors, which is available on our website. We have a list of everybody we work with. You can do that for five grand a month. Wow. So there's, it's accessible. We changed our model recently to make it more accessible for more manufacturers and, and more distributors to participate in our network. And then as we add value, then we can increase, increase the number of distributors we're syndicating to on your behalf, or we have a select tier or sorry, a premier tier of distributors. And those are, they have stronger data requirements and requires more effort on our part and so those come at a premium as well but again that's all listed on our website as well wow and when you look out over the next 18 24 months is there anything your customers are asking you for today that you don't yet do or do you see gaps in the market for things you don't yet do that you say hey look we don't do that today but 12 months from now or 24 months from now we would love to be doing these two three five things yeah that's a good question We're getting questions on ai yeah right? And I think where we're uniquely positioned is what we're, I think, I think what we're all quickly learning is large language models are fun. Small language models and specific language models are where there's actual value to be provided for businesses. Yes. Right. And so we've spent the last 10 years training data, right? We've been normalizing, training data, thinking about how writing rules against this data, standardizing it, standardizing data for the industrial markets for 10 years. And so 
the training data that we have for the models we're building is very strong. Yeah. And so as we, and that's why I mentioned earlier that we're getting ready to roll out additional models within our Acadia AI platform. And, but we're being, we want to hold ourselves to the same standard that we have when we do our syndication and our content IO subscriptions. And we're going to continue to roll out more models and we will you know, we'll be working on attribute normalization and like I said, product descriptions and product naming conventions. And we already, you can, we already have a categorization model. So you're a distributor, you get all these new products in, what's the first thing you have to do? Pick a category. Where do they get yes. mapped to? Yes. And traditionally, that involves people sitting in a room and all the getting all the product managers together and someone ordering lunch and then saying, okay, where were this goes to? there? Right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't want that product. That one doesn't align with my priorities. Oh, I want this one because I like working with that manufacturer. So a lot of human room for a lot human of politics. A lot of, a lot of politics, politics going too, on right? there. So we have a model in market now, our categorization model, where we're able to predict and suggest what where these products should go in your specific product categories so we can predict categories for new products we can also validate your existing categorization so we can look at your products and say you know what this one probably should have a fourth node because that would do a better job of describing it and helping people find that product um, what a lot of people don't realize is there's some search engines out there that won't return results for uncategorized products or at a minimum deprioritize uncategorized mm, products true. and cite faster, but it helps their site search performance. And so we had a, one of our, our distributors give us a list of 8,000 parts that they needed categorized. And so we ran our, uh, ran our model a few times and got to where we felt it was a really strong prediction of where it should be and a suggestion of where it should be. They, they reviewed the first 500 manually, approved all but three, and said, you know what, we're just going to auto-approve the other 7,500 because we'll just deal with the one or two that are three that are wrong, you know, have a 99% approval rate because that's stronger than when we get together and do it ourselves. <laughs> yeah, because if we went back and looked at it after the fact, we probably would find that we put some in the wrong place. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. And so now they saved all that time and they were able to get those products on their site and into market and into category much, much faster. And so that's a that's another subscription offer that we have. And so we have subscription tiers there, but then we'll also do for like large, if you have hundreds of thousands of SKUs, we'll treat that as a separate project. Um, oh yeah, rather than a subscription. That so that's what we're spending time building those out as well. But we're and we're doing it with the same rigor that we apply to every other process that we put in market because we understand the importance of being right. Yeah. And the risks of yeah. getting it wrong. Yeah, it's, and the risk of getting it big. wrong. Right. And presumably Generative AI for you guys also potentially takes two new forms, potentially. One is taking the, all this structured product data that we have and weaving it into a narrative that can form the basis of, say, for example, a long description, an mm -hmm. unstructured description of a, an item. Because oftentimes you'll have that. You'll have all the structured data, but you've got no long description for the product. Yep. And so you can take all that data, that, that structured data, and say, look, okay, now we can create a description for this product. Yep. Presumably, Gen AI is going to be able to help you guys with that and to help plug some of those gaps where there's no long description, no narrative, no what we would call romance copy. There's none right. of that. It doesn't exist. Right. We've, got these, we've got these product attributes, but that's it. B2B's and second, along, and we're calling that romance copy, right? That's a... Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, have, we have to call it something. Might as well call it something romantic. In the B2B world, uh, yeah. I don't know if anything is, is described romantically, yeah. But, yeah, but, exactly. but there we are. Uh, but then the second place I would imagine is companies like Ocular and a few others are doing a really good job of basically taking machine vision and saying, this product looks like this. We have no structured data attributes against it, but we know what it looks like, and we can at least put some basic structured data against sure. it. Now, they mainly work in aesthetic industries, i.e. fashion, where the aesthetics of a product yeah. are the attributes of the product. Okay, this is a blue yeah. polka dot dress. Cool. We can call it a blue polka dot dress, or it's got a V-neck. Okay, cool. It's obvious it's got a V-neck. It's not going to kill anyone. If we misattribute this dress, it's <laughs> right. probably not going to kill anyone, right. except for the woman who buys it for an event, and she gets right. pissed off because it's wrong. But other than that, it feels like Gen AI is going to be able to plug some holes in the the product data in unique ways at scale that's yeah. very difficult to do with humans. Yep. Yeah, and, and that's exactly the way we're approaching it, right? We're approaching it, like I said, with the same and requirement for being right and accurate that that our customers require, but we're testing out these capabilities and, and seeing what works and, and also what doesn't. Yes. Right? That's just as important as what works. So 
couldn't agree more. Wow, what a fascinating conversation. We've been at this for over 40 minutes now, and it's absolutely flown by. It's, I tell you, this data thing, it, the, the more, well, usually when I go in to consult with brands, the for one of the first things I do before we even get into formal discovery is, can you supply me a sample of your product data? Pick a cross-section of 50 products from across your categories and give me an example. Give me a sample of this. Then do the same thing. Pick uh, 50 accounts or 10 accounts of customer data and give me an export, a sample of the customer data that you have. Yep. And show me what that looks like. Yep. And usually, even before we get into formal discovery, I can tell them where some of their biggest problems in their business are once I look at their data. Because yeah. if their data is a disaster, and nine times out of 10, it's a disaster, this is a real problem. And unfortunately, the double-edged sword of the B2B world is that oftentimes we have sales teams and sales reps with a whole ton of institutional knowledge about around products Yep. And it's all in their heads or it's in a bunch of print catalogs, but it's nowhere else. Yep. And so historically, when they didn't have e-commerce and they were doing everything via sales rep, it didn't really matter because the sales rep had the knowledge. They could go out and they could have the conversation. They could ask the question of the customer and say, what are the products you need? And I can make sure that we put in the right order for the right products and it gets shipped out to you. Nowadays, the product data becomes really important and getting that institutional knowledge out of people's heads and into some sort of structured data system becomes more important than ever before because these people with that institutional knowledge, they're not getting any younger. Sometimes they're either leaving the business, they're dying, they're exiting the industry, they're retiring, whatever it is they're doing. And the, the reality is if that institutional knowledge was only with them, you're in deep shit when they yep. exit the business. And yep. so I'd like to think that B2B brands are realizing the risk of institutional knowledge leaving the business with their best people and starting to be a little bit more proactive about getting that data into systems of record that will persist. Yeah. But it's still a major issue from my experience. Yeah. No, one of the one of the things I always like to talk about when it comes to site search, it's one of my favorite things to work on when I'm on the e-commerce side of the equation or on the on, not on the provider side. On the side, brand you know, side. On, on the, the brand side. side, right? Again, it sounds obvious when you say it out loud, but you can only find what's there to be found. And so oftentimes I'll see people say, oh, we need a new platform. Oh, we need a new site search provider. Oh, we need a new CMS. I'm like, Let's go with Algolia because it'll right. fix everything. It can't work with no data. Yeah, exactly. And so what I find is your site search platform, your commerce platform, your conversion rates, your checkout, all those things improve when your product data gets better because there's more things able to be found than the questions of, hey, I'm on the website and I can't find this. What did you search for? How do you expect it to find that? And there's natural language search and people are referential and it's getting better, but still, um, when people have very specific requests and very specific requirements and they're searching for, it's just, it needs, the data needs to be there. The raw and, material has to be there. Yeah, and another thing I, I used to like to do um, you're talking about trying to get the expertise out of the minds of the experts. And so it was a little bit of a trade-off. I said, hey, you guys are always looking for ways, and guys in general sense, you, people are always looking for a way to impact the, the presentation of their products on site. And I'm always looking for user-generated content. So I would use Q&A features of the different products that are out there to do that and give it to my product managers and say, ask all the questions that you know your customers are asking, salespeople, customer service people, ask all the questions and then answer them. And we will load that up on every product detail page. And now I have UGC and I'm getting that expertise out of your head and you're getting to make all the changes to your page through this other interface that doesn't have to go through the standard merchandising review and merchandising process. Now I'd still have a merchandiser review it before we published it, of course. But, but it was a great way. It was a win. I got the information out of their head. I got user-generated content structured in a way that the search engines like, and they got a way to impact the pages that were most important to them in a much more expeditious and quick manner. And that that is a very nice segue into one final point that I want to cover off, yeah. which is that B2B brands are finally starting to realize that Google can't index what it can't see. And historically in the B2B world, yeah. logins are always gated. Yep. The website, e-commerce website, fully gated, can't see anything, can't see the products, can't see prices, can't see inventory, can't see nothing until you're authenticated, right? B2B brands are slowly starting to realize that doesn't really work in an SEO-driven world. No. We need to have long-tail SEO results in Google yeah. so that when buyer A is looking for widget X and we sell widget X, and they're going to be doing a Google search for this, if we don't turn up in their Google search results, we're not going to be under consideration to supply 
widget X. Yeah. And I think this is a huge thing, and brands are st slowly starting to come around to the idea, okay, maybe I don't show pricing. Okay, maybe I don't show inventory. Maybe maybe you still got to authenticate to see that because we've got distributor-specific pricing or whatever it sure. might be. Maybe we've even got restricted catalogs, meaning that not all customers can buy all SKUs. Right. But of the subset of products that all of our customers have access to, we're going to show those. We won't show price and inventory, but we're going to show the most basic catalog that is available to absolutely every one of our trade accounts. We're going to show at least that. Yep. We're going to make that not behind a gated login. That's going to be an open catalog that can be indexed by Google. And then we're going to use our website for customer acquisition, yeah. not just transactions. Yeah. And this is becoming a much bigger thing. And so as you rightly point out, if you don't have great product data, there's not a lot for Google to index. And this yeah. is a real challenge when you want to be recognized for the long tail SEO of your very specific products, because you might have 10 pumps that look visually absolutely identical, but they have very different specifications. Yep. Power specifications, inlet size, outlet size, throughput, head of, he, amount of head they can handle, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You've got all these different attributes that are really unique to, for a product that looks virtually identical visually. And even Google with its visual AI, it's going to look at it and say, these basically look the same. Yep. No, they're not the same. They have different specifications. And so if we can at least get the right data against the right products and surface that to Google, then at least we're going to have a shot of becoming the supplier to this buyer. Yep. And that's a really important thing I think that you're raising here, yep. which is that especially during COVID, these B2B brands realize, geez, B2B customer acquisition is a big deal. And yep. we need to be able to have digital routes to market because our sales reps can't go out and see people anymore. So this is a really important thing. Yep. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. No, I, and I would even always argue for at least showing list price and people know yes. that you can negotiate yes. and that you're going to have yes. distributor specific pricing available or customer specific pricing available upon login and inventory levels. You can go back and forth on maybe in stock, out of stock, at least. A, yes. A, or red, yellow, halfway. green. But yeah, not seeing a price is always a, it's all you can make me do more work now. Okay. Yeah. I just need an answer. I came yeah. here to get an answer. I didn't get the full answer. Who can give yeah. me the answer? Somebody else is going to give me that answer. Right. Yes. Uh, yeah. Is it in stock? And at least what's your standard trade price on this? Yeah, thing? exactly. What's the most I'm going to pay? Yeah, what's exactly. The most I love pay? that. What's the, the rack rate? Pay? It's the rack rate. That's right. What's the list? What's the list price on this yeah. bad boy? Yeah, exactly. Amazing. Listen, this has been a fabulous conversation. I've, I've really enjoyed it. We're, we're on the same page same around here. some of the challenges our industry is facing. This is These are universal time immemorial challenges around data management. It's just a thing. And I think the B2C and D2C world has got this right sooner than the B2B world because so many retail products have a visual element to them, sure. whether it's furniture or clothing or a, 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 a mug that you want to buy dad or it doesn't really matter what it is. Uh, most of your retail B2C, D2C goods, they've got a visual element to them that matters. Yep. And so it feels like most of these major retailers have figured out that this product data thing, it's real important. If we want to sell and we want to have a high conversion rate, we better get our shit together when it yep. comes to product data. Yep. But B2B brands, they seem like they've been a little bit late to the party, but with platforms and technology like yours, it allows them to leapfrog and go from a really bad place to a really good place really fast yeah. and at, a, at, a, and at a, a cost that's digestible for the majority of, of brands out there. Yeah. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Again, couldn't have said it better myself. I love it. <laughs> Listen, amazing conversation. Listen, I'm going to put a link to your LinkedIn profile in the show notes. I will Thank also you. put a link to your website, the DDS website. Other than that, if people want to speak to you about this whole concept of data management and supply and standardization and linking, how's best to get a hold of you? Yeah. Honestly, go to distributordatasolutions.com. That's probably the best place to do it or follow the link or just hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm very active on LinkedIn. I love the platform and what it's done for our community of marketers and uh, e-commerce providers. So I'm out there all the time. Andrew, absolutely amazing. Now we're, as we come down to the end of our time together, this is where I get to flip the script. I get to hand, uh, hand the microphone over to you. I get to let you ask me one question, any question you like. could be personal or professional. So Andrew Carlson from DDS, what is your question for me? Sure. Before we started recording, you were talking about, you were, we were talking about our dogs. Yes. Right? Yes. So how did your dog become a part of your family? He chose us. He chose us. And okay. he is a, he's a terrier. He's a mutt, but he's mostly Jack Russell mixed with Beagle. Okay. So he's, he's a hunter and a tracker, and he's seven years old, 
and I was still living in New Zealand. We were still, my wife and I were still living in New Zealand. We were living in an off-grid tiny house on a rural property. Very cool. And we were on a long, one kilometer long gravel road, and there were multiple people living on this road. And about three doors down on this main gravel road, a family was running a dog rescue. Okay. And he was a rescue. He was a rescue dog. And he, unfortunately, he was one of the smallest dogs in their dog rescue. And they had a lot of very big, very scary looking dogs. Sure. And he didn't really like sharing attention or food with these other big dogs. And so yeah. he would escape out underneath their fence. Okay. And I was working from home <laughs> as a digital nomad, working from home uh, yep. during COVID, especially I was working from yep. home and my place was quiet. Yep. And so he used to escape up and come and sit at my feet during the day and I'd usually have my front door open and he'd come in and he would just make himself at home. Sure. And then I made the fatal mistake. We made the fatal mistake of feeding him a little bit of food one day. And then of course he would come and he would stay with us. And then he started coming regularly every single day. And then he would go home at 5 p.m. when he was supposed to be fed. He would rush <laughs> off home and then he would come back the next day. And then we became very good friends with the people that ran this dog rescue. They sure. became d dear friends of ours. And I told my wife, Sarah, one day, I don't know how and I don't know when but I have a feeling this we're going to end up owning this dog. <laughs> this is going to end up being our dog. I don't know how, but it's just yeah. dogs choose you. You don't choose them. And it yeah. feels like he's chosen us. And right. literally within about three days after that, our dear friends sent us a message and said, Herbie seems to really enjoy staying at your place. Yeah. Would you like to consider adopting him? Yeah. And we said, sure, let's, let's let him stay here. And yeah. if he enjoys it, and he wants to stay, we'll start feeding him. We'll take responsibility and ownership of him. And if he decides he wants to stay here, then uh, we'll let him stay. Yep. And and he never left yep. after that. Yep. And uh, and that's how we came to have Herbie in our life. And that's we su feel super blessed to have him. He's an absolute character. We call him our little special needs dog because I tell you, he's so demanding. And <laughs> he's super, super duper smart. And that's a double-edged sword with a yep. terrier. Yep. And super active. But he forces me to get outside at least twice a day and walk him. Otherwise, he's climbing the walls cool. with em energy. Yep. So he forces, me to, he forces me to get out and do my 10,000 steps a day, which is nice. I, I can't complain about that. Nice. Nice. And he was our guard dog for our entire 12 months of driving around Mexico, traveling around. He was the guard dog in the back seat, and <laughs> we felt much safer having him aboard, that's for sure. That's great. That's and great. your dog is one, right? Yeah. And what kind of dog have you got? He's a mix of a Border Collie and a Retriever, and we think a little bit of a Spaniel. Not quite sure. But Hybrid vigor. Yeah, hi yeah, exactly. He acts like a. he has the demeanor of a Retriever with the activity of a Border Collie. Yeah. Okay, so he's um, got working dog energy. Yeah. Yep. Wow. But yeah, he was a rescue as well. He was about five months old, and we got him in South Bend, Indiana. I rescued him from being a fan of Notre Dame is what I tell everybody. <laughs> we don't want that to happen. The fate worse than death is what you're saying. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but, but yeah, and just a quick funny story about the... So we pick him up from the... For, go meet him and figure out how it's going to work, and we're driving home and have experience adopting dogs before and you know, sometimes they're pretty nervous on their first day and their first car ride and i'm like i'm gonna put a big old sheet that i would use to paint right over the back seat just to be safe or we got the we got bowie you know, named after david bowie in our in the back seat with my daughter and my wife's in the front seat and we're about halfway home and i thought i'm also going to take the expressway i'm going to take side streets just in case i have to pull over quickly for any reason so we took side streets and county highways home and about halfway home i hear this noise and it just sounds like somebody pouring like water out of a into a sink or something like that and and all of a sudden my daughter starts yelling he's <laughs> pooping <laughs> and I'm, I'm hearing that sound and rec reconciling with her voice and i'm realizing like, he's just not it's not regular poop let's just put it that it, way. It, it's projectile diarrhea it's not great and so i pull over to the nearest and the irony is that i pull over into the parking lot and this place is called the viking chili bowl <laughs> oh god <laughs> and which was being disgorged in your yeah, back seat yeah exactly it was closed it was on a Sunday, late Sunday afternoon. They were already closed for the day, so there was nobody there. But I just have this visual of me, like, cleaning out the back seat. I just took the sheet and threw it away. So I'm walking. We brought plastic bags and everything. I, I was planned. <laughs> so I walked back to the dumpster behind the place, put it all in the dumpster. Um, people, were, There was the people next door at the store, and I was like, what is this guy doing? And then... Is that a body in there? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So yeah, so I'm sure the food's really good there, but just I, I don't think I'll ever be able to eat there. Because <laughs> yes, the memory association with that is not good. Yeah, not I look, good at I all. look up, I'm like, really? Chili bowl? Okay, perfect. Love it, but we love yeah. our dogs, don't yeah. we? I reckon humans don't deserve dogs. Yep. That's the truth. Agreed. We're, we're very yeah. lucky. Andrew, fantastic chat. Hey, it's been an absolute here. blast. Can't wait same to speak here. to you again soon, my friend. Yeah. Have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Be good. Take care.
Are you a B2B or D2C e-commerce merchant? Then head over to greenwoodconsulting.net to learn how we can help you scale your business.